The fourth section of this four-part series, which lasts about an hour, discusses various mechanisms for making assets available to a subsidiary. These mechanisms include transfers in exchange for newly issued shares, contributions to capital where no shares are issued, sales, and leases and licenses. In addition, there is some discussion of local loans involving parent company guarantees and thin capitalization rules. Going to the, uh, the next slide here, uh, and uh, this is now getting to what Yakuta brought up before, which was, gee, uh, you know, we could sell. Okay, there, I've put down six bullet points for different mechanisms for how assets can be made available to a subsidiary. Now, notice I'm not saying mechanisms for transferring the assets. I'm saying make available to so that the subsidiary has the use. The uh, assets will be physically available in you know, your country because they're going to be used in your, uh, your country. But we need to be looking at this broadly in terms of their being available for use and not just restrict our thinking to an actual transfer of ownership. Okay, so first of all, uh, first bullet point, the parent could transfer assets, whether cash or in-kind assets. In-kind, if you haven't seen that term before, uh, normally means that an asset other than cash is being, uh, in this case, okay, transferred in exchange for uh, shares. Uh, so it could be tables, machinery, uh, uh, intellectual property could be uh, could be anything. This first one again, uh, an actual transfer of the of either the ownership of or rights to, in exchange for uh, ca uh, for shares uh, of ownership uh, being issued by the recipient company. If we attempt to draw a quick picture, we have uh, okay ABC. We have the subsidiary and the actual asset, uh, either the asset, or the, either the ownership of the asset or perhaps just rights, for example, uh, in terms of intellectual property, you could have a uh, license, a royalty-free license. Uh, could be transferred, and the subsidiary will issue issue shares or ownership units or whatever its uh, its structure is. Would it be taxable the transfer of asset from ABC to subsidiary and subsidiary issuing shares to ABC? Okay, that's a good question. When you say would it be taxable? You of course have to have to also say uh, uh, which government uh, might tax it. Okay, so let's start. Which uh, ABC is in the U.S. and uh, this is you know some uh, country B. So you need to ask for both countries. Is there any tax consequence of doing this? Now, for ABC, uh, okay, transfer an asset, receive uh, another asset, which is the shares. Now, is, is that under general United States tax law, is that uh, normally a taxable transaction? Uh, and let's let's do it very carefully, step by step. Okay, what's the general rule if I, you know, transfer this to Wen Da and he gives me, you know, his uh, brick in return? Then it's a taxable event. Okay, it's a taxable event. So that's the general rule. 
Okay, now why did you say, well, gee, uh, in this case, it's tax-free in the United States? Why did you say that? Well, I was thinking about um, a corporation in respect of 351. Excellent. And I was thinking that if ABC were to hold more than a, a specified number of shares, then the transaction could be free. Okay, good. So you're... The, the general rule is an exchange is taxable. But now you're referring to an exception, which essentially says that if ABC owns 80% or more of the subsidiary and it transfers property in exchange for shares, it's a non-taxable transaction, carryover basis. Okay, now you probably haven't gotten to it yet in international tax too. But then there's another one that says, okay, in the case of Section 351 transactions where a transfer to another country is involved, then 351 only applies to a certain extent. And especially with regard to intangible property, it gives you some absolutely terrible results. Absolutely terrible. That's your 367D. So uh, the point, your question is an excellent one. Is there taxation? And yes, there might be, depending on the assets being transferred, and uh, uh, you'd have to go methodically through the rules. General rule, 351, 367. So that would be your approach, and you would decide, okay, how will ABC be taxed in the United States. Now, for your work on Assignment 4, uh, the instructions I have given you, if you have read them carefully, the, the instructions I gave you said that you do not need to look at the detailed rules in the United States. Focus on the country, your chosen countries. However, I did ask that you just give a list of issues, and it can just be like one or two words in term, you know, for each listing point, uh, a list of the issues which would have to be looked at from a U.S. standpoint. And yes, one of them would be, is there a tax cost? In other words, if you, had, uh, if you uh, advise that, uh, gee, it's a really great idea to have the uh, ownership uh, let's say, come down to the subsidiary in exchange for shares. That works really well in your, your country. Then one of the issues would be, uh, will this be a taxable transaction under Section 367 uh, in the United States? Or is it, is it tax-free? Now, if you want to get into that and write about it, great. I'm very happy to, to see what you do. Because again, this is a wonderful exercise to go through and understand the U.S. rules if you want to get into that. So I very strongly encourage you to do it. But I'm not requiring it. Uh, I'm not requiring it. Now, at the subsidiary level, uh, in country B, Again, we have to answer your question for each country. At the subsidiary level, well, actually, country B has potentially two taxes. One is, would country B tax ABC, on it, assuming that ABC has a gain? And then number two, is there a tax on the subsidiary on its receipt of the equipment or tax-free, I'm sorry, uh, or royalty-free license or whatever it is that's being transferred, uh, will the subsidiary have a gain which is taxable in country B? So there's actually two questions. Now, typically, just as we have talked about before, that if ABC were selling inventory to a subsidiary for cash, 
normally, if ABC it does not have a permanent establishment or not doing business, normally ABC will not be taxed on that. And the same, the same uh, tax rules uh, in country B will generally apply to that, where there's not a transfer of inventory, but a transfer of you know, assets like machinery and, and so on. You want to make sure that you do it in a manner that doesn't cause ABC to be taxable. Uh, if the fair market value of the assets being transferred is less than the cost basis in the hands of ABC. And you've been told, uh, before you ask your next question, again, you've been told that the cost of that machinery is 10 million. The fair market value, if it were sold to a third party, is, I think, 15 million. So yeah, there is a gain. There is economically, when you look at the separate legal entities, there is a gain. Is there a real economic gain from the standpoint of ABC on a consolidated basis? Of course not. But on a separate entity basis, absolutely. There is a gain. In general, country B will not be able to tax that gain because of the same rules that cause uh, country B not to be able to tax the profit on inventory that's sold to a subsidiary. OK, now what about at the subsidiary level? The subsidiary has received the ownership of assets that's worth $15 million, and they issued share capital that cost them nothing. Maybe there's you know, maybe there's something that they have to pay the government for the, uh, you know, uh, maybe there, there are sometimes a capital tax, uh, you know, when you issue capital, you have to pay a small amount to, uh, to the local government. But let's ignore that as a possibility. The subsidiary has just put on its balance sheet fixed assets, you know, let's say machinery, of uh, 100, and the capital is now 200. Now, again, uh, most countries will say, will have some sort of internal tax rule that says when a corporation receives, receives property and shares are issued, that is not considered a taxable transaction. One should never assume that the issuance of capital will never create taxable income. As a postscript, note that the Indian tax authorities have attempted several times to create taxable income within an Indian subsidiary that has issued additional shares to a foreign related company at a price that is less than the fair market value as determined by the tax authorities. Say that the actual issue price of additional shares was 100, and the related foreign company paid this 100 amount in cash to the Indian subsidiary. Later, the Indian tax authorities say that the proper fair market value of the issued shares was 150. They asserted that this created 50 of income, and that the Indian company was deemed to have made a loan of 50 to the related foreign company on which interest income could be imputed to the Indian subsidiary. This argument has been asserted against the Indian subsidiaries of both Shell and Vodafone, and presumably against other Indian taxpayers as well. But now, let's go to the second one up here. Parent contribution to subsidiaries' capital, no shares issued in exchange. We find uh, domestically within the United States, we find a lot of cases where companies will transfer to their subsidiaries assets 
and they won't bother to go through the corporate procedure of issuing shares. Now, is that because there is some innate logic that says uh, that whenever a company receives something from a shareholder, it's not income? Or is there something specifically in the US tax code which says that a contribution made by a shareholder is just not taxable? If you look at section 118, it says in relatively simple terms with uh, you know, an exception or two, that amounts received from a shareholder are not taxable income. Methodically, you'd start out and say, gee, uh, section 61 says that you know, all items of income or all uh, amounts received uh, are considered income and uh, will be taxable. And then there's a provision which says that, well, gee, in this case, it's not. So 118 overrides your basic Section 61. Okay, that's the U.S. rule. Even they do not file consolidated return income. Yeah, even if even if uh, the shareholder owns only you know a small percentage. Now we're uh, again the uh, when you. Th uh, look at the situation of the shareholder transferring something, receiving nothing in return. Uh, in a sense, there's, uh, you know, it's sort of like that one-sided entry. Uh, you know, he's just transferring it, but he's getting nothing back. Well, in theory, he is getting something back. The by transferring an asset into the company, the value of the shares he holds goes up at least to the extent of his percentage interest. Uh, now, uh, if he only owns 1%, then he's caused the 99% other shareholders to have their value increased as well. So, then you look at it and say, well, gee, has this shareholder which transferred the asset, has he made a gift to the other shareholders? And maybe that's something that you have to worry about. But you have to think about the economics and analyze it in that, that way. Yes? Professor, if a shareholder contributes a property to a corporation, would his basis increase the, uh, in the corporation? It, yeah, it increases the assets within the corporation, yes. Mm -hmm. Not his basis, which he has in the corporation. If you have a contribution to capital by one shareholder, mm -hmm. uh, there will be, uh, and I, I want to say it's either 358 or 362, there are rules that give the, that transferring person basis mm -hmm. for what, for the, uh, for what he has transferred, and it's going to be, uh, under normal circumstances, a, uh, a basis equal to the basis uh, of what he transferred. The, the reason for bringing up these U.S. rules is to say, well, you know, frankly, I don't remember the answer for China, but uh, uh, using China as an example, and we can, I think, look at uh, Japan the same way, if we look back to our picture here, okay, if an asset is received and there is no issuance of new shares or ownership interest, well, there better be in the local country a provision which specifically says that that's not income. And some reasonable number of countries I've looked at over the years do not have that. And as a result, a contribution to capital for some countries, a contribution to capital where there is no issuance of shares, can give you taxable income at the subsidiary level equal to the fair market value of what's received. If you felt that there was a reason to transfer something, you know, shareholder transfer without the issuance of shares, that's an issue. Now, interestingly enough, if you, uh, again, getting back to your 367, 
uh, there's something in 367 which tells you that if there is a transfer by a U.S. company to a foreign subsidiary and it's as a contribution to capital and no shares are received, so it's not a 351 type of transaction, it'll generally be treated for, uh, for at least 367 purposes as if it were a 351 qualified transaction. Mechanically, you know, these things may be treated one way by the U.S., but you're looking at your country B, your chosen countries. How are these things treated in your countries? Okay, the third bullet point up there is to transfer assets as a sale in exchange for cash or a payable. Uh, if it's a payable to the parent, uh, of course, then you'd uh, need to look at that and at the terms of that payable. Uh, you know, what are the terms? And you get to a question of, well, if this is not just a short-term payable, it's going to be paid off quite quickly. Uh, is it true debt or is it equity characterized under both in this case for, for, uh, uh, for uh, assignment four, uh, for U.S. purposes, is it equity or debt? And under your local country rules, is it equity or debt? If it's true debt, do thin capitalization rules apply to, uh, to prevent some amount of interest deductibility uh, under this, uh, this uh, obligation? Now, if, of course, there's going to be a payment of cash, you get back to the question of, gee, where does the cash come from? If we look back at our, our balance sheet, of course, if the, uh, if the company, the subsidiary, is going to pay cash, it either has to borrow the cash from somebody or it has to receive more capital from the, the shareholder. Or one, a third thing is it already has operations which are generating additional cash and then it, in a sense, uses its own cash. In assignment four, your company is starting a new business. It has no existing operations that are generating cash. So if you are recommending that there be a purchase of the asset, then, needless to say, you have to ask where the cash is going to come from and provide that as part of your, uh, your recommendations. The next bullet point, okay, purchase by subsidiary from some other party, some, from some party other than the parent using debt or cash received from the parent or borrowed from unrelated or related lenders. Clearly, uh, subsidiary can obtain you know, use of assets uh, through that fashion. Yeah, fifth bullet point, lease or license from related or unrelated party. Okay, lease or license. Okay, now, with regard to the first four, notice that if we think about our balance sheet, there's an actual transfer of the ownership of, for example, a fixed asset or some sort of rights with respect to intellectual property, for example, a royalty-free license. In those cases, you're actually going to have on the balance sheet, you're going to actually have the asset over here and you're actually going to have uh, a liability or you're, if you pay with cash, you're going to have less cash. But the asset is going to be on the local balance sheet. And again, I was making the point that this might be important if you need to have enough investment on the local balance sheet in order to qualify for local incentives in your countries. The next one we said was lease or license. 
Okay, now what is a lease or license? Uh, and again, I'm assuming a real lease or license, uh, uh, not one that is economically treated like a, uh, not one that's economically treated like it uh, were a sale. Remember we talked uh, last week or the week before about uh, situations where a lease of an airplane might be economically like the purchase of the airplane. So let's assume we're not talking about that, but we have a true lease. Do we have any asset on the balance sheet when we have a, uh, a lease? We don't. Do we have any liability on the balance sheet when we have a lease? We don't. We just pay on a rateable basis, you know, once a year or once every quarter or monthly or whatever the lease agreement says, we make payment of our, uh, we make our lease payments on a regular basis and there's nothing on the balance sheet. So the use of the asset is available to the subsidiary, but it's not on the balance sheet. Why might a lease, or I shouldn't say why, why might a lease be a good idea or a bad idea, but rather, what are some of the differences that we could look at between having the asset on the balance sheet and not having the asset on the balance sheet because we have a lease or a license in place? If we have a machine of 100 there on the balance sheet, what do we typically have in the way of a tax consequence of having an asset on the balance sheet? Yeah, depreciation. Now, uh, this, I think the, uh, I think the facts that you've been given say that there's what, a 20 year life? 20 year useful life for this equipment? Well, how is it going to be depreciated in your country? Well, maybe you have access to that kind of detailed information, maybe you don't. But for the subsidiary under ABC, uh, if there are uh, accelerated depreciation rules, then maybe this 100 gets depreciated over a a uh, very relatively short period of time. On the other hand, if they're not, then maybe it's depreciated 5% a year for 20 years. Well, that gives you some economic difference within the subsidiary in its tax calculation. Maybe there are investment allowances where you're allowed an extra benefit, for example, a 10% credit. Uh, in other words, 10% of the 100 becomes a credit that reduces your tax liability. So 10% would be 10. So just like we've talked about a foreign tax credit, reducing on a dollar for dollar basis, uh, you know, your tax on uh, foreign source income. And investment allowance sometimes is structured as a tax credit that reduces future tax. Okay, let's say that uh, you have a case like in Thailand and you have an eight year tax holiday, let's say. Well, is depreciation useful when there's a tax holiday? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. So, uh, having you know, a depreciation on that hundred, if you have a tax holiday for the next eight years, depreciation might not be worth very much. But the tax holiday, you don't pay tax. For example, uh, I think you looked at some of the incentives for China. Now, there's a lot less incentives now than there used to be, but uh, now there's for several years, I think a full uh, you know, if you invest in certain places, you pay zero tax on your income for a couple of years, and then uh, for another year or two, you uh, pay 50% uh, 
uh, tax at a uh, fifty percent of the normal rate, if I remember correctly. Right. Yeah, that's the tax holiday. Uh, Thailand has that kind of thing. Uh, Singapore has it. Malaysia has it. Uh, uh, so it's it's something that's relatively common in a lot of countries because they've learned that yeah, that's a way to attract foreign investment. But we've talked a little bit about depreciation. Oh, one more thing about depreciation. What is the maximum amount of depreciation we have when the basis is 100? Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> See, this is a man of great intellectual capacity. You are OK, one guy. Yes, the limit is 100. Let's say we have a lease. And let's say we determine that the fair market rental is, let's say, uh, eight. OK, and let's say that that fair market rental of eight is going to be the same for the next 20 years. What's eight times 20? Mind like a computer. Very good. OK, so 160. OK, 160 is more than 100. Further, uh, over the years, there's maybe inflation. Maybe we renew the lease at the current fair market rental. Maybe the rental goes to 10, you know, five years from now. So a lease provides a mechanism for getting more money out of the subsidiary and to the parent. Maybe that's something you want to do. If you are, if your subsidiary is in a high tax country, gee, that's a really brilliant idea. On the other hand, if the subsidiary has a tax holiday and Gee, you're better off maximizing the income in the subsidiary, then maybe you're better off with depreciation. You can have different, uh, different results, different economics that result from different contractual relationships, uh, you know, purchase of the asset versus a acquiring the use through lease. Uh, there's also withholding tax issues. Is there normally any tax in country B when the parent ABC sells the asset to the subsidiary? We've talked about this. The answer is no. On the other hand, is there withholding tax on rental payments? Well, very often under domestic law, there will be. And you need to look at the ta any applicable tax treaty. How is rental treated under the tax treaty. Let me ask you this question. When you're saying that rental payments are more beneficial from the first day that more money gets out of the subsidiary to the parent company? If your objective is to have more money out of the subsidiary, then yes, that could be beneficial. But that might not be your objective. Again, you know, if you're looking at a tax holiday, maybe you want to maximize the profit in the subsidiary, and you'd say, I don't want to have a lease which takes more money out. Which is better is going to depend on several factors, one of which is, uh, you know, do you want more money inside the subsidiary, or do you want mechanisms that take money out of the subsidiary? Your objective will determine whether one way is better or the other way is better the potential withholding tax consequences, the foreign tax credit position of ABC at the top uh, could be part of this decision process as well. I mean, I'm not saying that this is, uh, is easy, at, at, especially at the start, as you look at these things, it seems like there's you know, all these factors, and you know, how, do I, uh, how do I reconcile them? And yeah, at the start, as you're doing this, it is difficult, but if you methodically go through the various things, 
you know, in light of your client's real facts and in light of their real objectives, you'll end up that it will normally be obvious that one approach is better than another. If you look through, you know, legally what happens uh, and economically what happens in the particular country with regard to each of these alternatives, uh, at the end of the day, after you've gone through your methodical process, you'll normally find that, yeah, gee, this is the best answer because of my analysis that show, and, you know, for example, that, gee, there's a tax holiday, uh, there's, uh, it avoids withholding tax, it, ma it maximizes uh, uh, income within this local company. Uh, I mean, again, the answer for what is best will depend on the facts of the situation. One time it'll be one way, one, another time it'll be the other way. The um, extensive uh, foreign tax credits uh, in ABC, that, that only, it only has real meaning if the su subsidiary that jurisdiction has very high uh, tax, is that right? Otherwise, we can always, uh, there is the foreign credit, foreign tax credit. Yeah. Otherwise, you generate new for, uh, foreign tax credit and you, 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 you can credit back all your foreign, foreign tax. Yes, that's, uh, that's correct. If, the... if that, that uh, foreign jurisdiction has really high uh, tax. Remember, high is uh, is a uh, is a hard yeah, term to figure out. For example, uh, the U.S. has a 30 percent rate, and you'd say, "Gee, that's terribly high." Maybe somebody else has a, you know, some other country has a five percent rate. Uh, even under a treaty, maybe it's five percent, uh, and you'd say, "Gee, that's low." But remember that those percentages are on gross income. If you have a lease and the rental income is, you know, let's say the rental income is 100 and let's say there's been a 5% tax, okay, the tax is 5, but remember when you think about high and the foreign tax credit, you have to think about what is the net income, not What's the gross income? The gross income is that 100. But once you subtract off depreciation, maybe related interest cost, uh, and any other expenses, maybe the taxable net income related to that rental income is, is only 10. And if that five of tax from, you know, withholding tax from the foreign country, that's at an effective 50% rate on net income. Uh, looking at the withholding tax and saying, gee, it's only 5% or 8% or whatever it is, you don't know whether it's high or low because you're comparing apples and oranges. The one is a percentage of gross, the withholding basis, the foreign tax credit computation is based on a net income computation. So you've got to work out the details. Now, I'm not, of course, asking you to, uh, for ABC's situation to go into ridiculous detail on it. I'm happy for you to, for example, make an assumption that, uh, you know, if you, uh, that, uh, if you decide that you want to recommend a lease arrangement, uh, I'm happy for you to just indicate in your listing of U.S. issues is uh, that you'd have to look at the question of withholding tax versus uh, the foreign tax credit limitation calculation to determine if this is, you know, how this affects the U.S. taxability. Uh, if under a tax treaty you find that there is no withholding tax on the rental, 
In other words, the country B does not impose a withholding tax on the rental, then that becomes you know, a source of zero tax foreign source income for your US foreign tax credit limitation calculation. And that, of course, is something which raises your limitation, does not add to the amount of taxes. And if otherwise the company has excess foreign tax credits, which is the facts you've been given for ABC, then, gee, that's a wonderful answer for ABC because they get zero tax foreign source income that allows them to use more, you know, use some of their uh, excess foreign tax credits. So the best solution is they don't pay foreign tax. So then yeah, they and well, so, well, certainly, yes, yeah, certainly that on an overall tax. basis, uh, that is true. And I think, uh, I think, again, in one of the answers, uh, I think I said all things being equal, yeah, because of their excess foreign tax credit position, they are going to generally be better off to pay less foreign tax. Well, because if you, uh, if the company is always in an excess foreign tax credit position because of foreign taxes on other unrelated income to this, to this investment, to this new project which is going to be set up, then to the extent you can have low or untaxed foreign source income from this project, that allows you to reduce your US tax on this new income by using the tax credits from the excess foreign tax credits from those other sources of income. Remember we said that ABC has some amount of income from its European uh, licensees and its European subsidiaries. Mm -hmm. And we said that that is what's causing excess foreign tax credits. I, I don't really get this argument. Uh, 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 ABC has excessive foreign credit, foreign tax credits. Yeah. And um, this access, it, excessive foreign tax credits, you don't want to pay any, you want to pay less foreign income tax because uh, I don't, I, I don't okay, understand. Yeah, okay, let me, let me go, uh, go over one, uh, let me see if I can come up with a, a, a quick example. Uh, I think we, we talked about this before, but it's, it's not an easy concept, so a second time I think is, uh, is a good idea. Let's say that you have uh, two, uh, two items of income. Okay, and let's say this is ABC. And they have the European operations. And let's just say that they earn 100. Uh, the US tax on that is 35, but they have let's say 50 of taxes on that 100 in some foreign country. So they have 50, their foreign tax credit limitation is 35, so they end up with 15 of excess foreign tax credits. Okay? Now, let's say that they have from this new investment, that they're going to set up the, uh, uh, the food processing facility and so on. Let's say that they have rental being thrown off, in other words, because you've decided to have a lease, let's just focus on the rental. They're going to have 100 of rental income, and let's assume that you've looked at carefully at the tax treaty between the United States and your chosen country, and let's say that there's no withholding tax on rentals. So at the subsidiary level, there's, of course, a deduction for the rental. So uh, there's no tax being paid in country B on this, because there's a deduction within the subsidiary, and then there's no withholding tax on the payment. 
So country B has not taxed this at all. So ABC has 100 of income. ABC has 35 of tax on that. But now, because of the 15 of excess credits over here, we reduce the US tax by 15, and we only pay 20 to the US on the 100 of rental income. So this is the cross-crediting that we talked about a, a week or two ago. This is the cross-credit. It's, you know, it's not an easy concept, uh, again, you know, from the standpoint of uh, trying to follow these things. Uh, it's, not, it's not intuitive. It's not, you know, immediately uh, easy to follow. But the point is, if you have low tax foreign source income at a time when you have excess foreign tax credits on other income, that gives you a, uh, a benefit because it reduces the U.S. tax that you would otherwise pay. This is cross-credit. Uh, but it's something which is so very basic to international tax planning. Uh, you find U.S. companies being very careful which subsidiaries pay dividends. They only want dividends to be paid by subsidiaries that have been taxed very heavily. Because if that's the case, they bring the money back to the United States, they get a foreign tax credit, and they pay no further U.S. tax. But if there's no excess foreign tax credits and they have money in a tax haven that has not been subjected to any foreign taxes, when they pay it back to the United States, they have to pay 35. So they will choose only to pay dividends from companies, subsidiaries, and countries that have imposed a high tax. Makes reasonable sense. If you have, you know, excess foreign tax credits, then they can bring some back from the tax haven. Because they use the excess foreign tax credits, they don't pay any further U.S. tax on that money that's coming from the tax haven. Okay, the uh, last item at the bottom, subsidiary borrowing uh, from... <laughs> third parties uh, with or without a shareholder guarantee. Uh, so focusing on with a, a shareholder guarantee. Uh, it very often happens that, let's say, the subsidiary is able to borrow from a third party. Could be a bank, could be some you know, other lender. And very often the lender will say, gee, I want a guarantee by the shareholder, because the shareholder is this big company, you know, ABC, we said has, what, 10 billion of, or I don't know, 50 billion of assets, and 25 billion of capital, uh, you know, they're very stable, very, uh, very wealthy. So we want a shareholder guarantee of the debt. Uh, so this is a very common thing that you see uh, is there a shareholder? You know, is there uh, an ability to borrow locally, and is there a requirement for a shareholder guarantee? Again, you know, where do they get the cash from to buy, for example, the uh, the assets? Uh, now, when there's a shareholder guarantee, there's a few a few questions. One question is uh, whether uh, the loan with a share or shareholder guarantee should be respected as a loan or whether it should be something else. Uh, and the second question is uh, a transfer pricing question. So let's just speak very briefly about the first question and then the second question. We have uh, ABC. We have the subsidiary. 
they found a local lender and the lender is going to make a loan uh, gotta be faster in reminding me uh, okay the shareholder uh, the uh, subsidiary is going to borrow money from a lender but the lender of course says gee I you know I trust you subsidiary but you know I know that ABC is the one with all the assets and so there's a shareholder guarantee now I think most country bees around the world would uh, would uh, treat this as true third-party debt I don't know that that's always true, but most countries would. But they, uh, and when we get to thin capitalization rules, which we'll mention in just a moment, uh, the the this third party debt might be considered to be related party debt for purposes of the thin capitalization rules. So that's that's one aspect. From a U.S. aspect. And this gets back to a substance versus form question. From a U.S. standpoint, is this truly a loan to the subsidiary? Or should this be recharacterized as a loan to ABC and then a contribution to capital of the subsidiary. Now, under uh, concepts in the United States and some number of other countries, you certainly have to look at a transaction and say, well, uh, would third parties, you know, true third parties have entered into this sort of an arrangement? Okay, well, where a subsidiary has assets, has a real business that's throwing off enough earnings that the lender is looking primarily to the credit worthiness of the subsidiary, then generally you'd say, okay, uh, that sounds like a pretty good situation. The lender is uh, lending to the subsidiary and just if the business goes uh, you know, goes kaput. Uh, if, the, the, if there's big problems with the business, then uh, the lender, as a last resort, would try to collect from ABC under the guarantee. But what if you have a situation where the subsidiary is getting the money, but they're getting in, into some business or some activity where it's clear there's not going to be enough cash generated to actually pay off the interest and the loan. In that sort of situation, the question is, well, gee, uh, was the, if the lender is looking primarily to repayment from ABC and not from the subsidiary, then there's a question, a substance versus form. Has the lender really loaned to ABC and then ABC passed that money as a contribution to capital to the subsidiary? What purpose do they want to achieve? Let's, uh, let's think about it. Uh, uh, let's look at ABC and let's assume uh, that the subsidiary, uh, you know, had no chance of making money in the first place, and the lender uh, really was looking to the credit worthiness of ABC. Okay. Now, if the U.S. tax authorities look at this, okay, what might the differences be? If if this is respected the way it is, then the subsidiary is, you know, paying interest to the lender let's say, or at least owes interest to the lender. And there's no U.S. consequences. The 
source of the interest is based on the location of the subsidiary and the lender uh, just is not taxable by the US. But if this is recharacterized as a loan to the United States, uh, ABC, and then money is passed down to the subsidiary as a contribution to capital, then to the extent that any money gets paid as interest to L, it's treated as a payment by ABC. And now we have U.S. source interest. And is there withholding tax on it? Uh, further, uh, any time uh, uh, any payment is made by the subsidiary to the <coughs> lender under this recharacterized transaction, the subsidiary would be considered to have made a distribution with respect to the shares to the parent, and the parent makes its interest payment or principal repayment. So you have a dividend effect, possibly, or return of capital or capital gain, whatever, under your, uh, your corporate rules, uh, in the hands of ABC. So you can have uh, some you know, crazy results on the US side uh, where you have something like this if the subsidiary is, bo you know, is borrowing more than it could ever repay back. So the IRS can get dividend tax and withholding tax if they recharacterize the, the yeah. thing. Professor, um, even if ABC gives a guarantee to the lender, why can't the lender also give a money to the subsidiary? Why does it have to give to ABC? It doesn't give it to it. It's a recharacterization of what is physically happens. In other words, what physically happened is yes, it goes directly from the lender to the subsidiary. Now let's go back a step. Remember we talked earlier about China having you know, really serious rules about how much capital there can be, how much debt there can be. Most other countries don't have similar rules. They like Japan might have a few million yen being the, uh, I want to say with the, for KK, I think it was 10 million and maybe 3 million for, uh, sort of coming back to me a little bit, for the Yugen Geisha. Yeah, to oh, to one end. Okay, so, so actually it's even uh, <clears throat> better now. You could have a, uh, a company with only one yen of capital. You know how much one yen is? Nothing. What do you mean it's nothing? It's like a penny or so. <laughs> Why? That's penny saved is a penny earned. You should not forget that. Uh -huh. Really important concept. Penny saved is a penny earned. Okay, so with that in mind, the point is it is not unusual to see a subsidiary with only a nominal amount of capital and a whole bunch of debt. Okay. Well, maybe in you know, your country B, you can do that, and you can have this debt uh, to the uh, subsidiary by a local lender. Maybe that's fully respected in your local country, and you say, hey, you know, maybe there's a very loose, uh, thin capitalization rule. So you'd say, this really works for my country. Maximize the amount of debt. But uh, maybe from a US standpoint at the top, uh, maybe it would not be respected. Maybe there'd be risk of this happening. So again, when we're working with two different countries, sort of have to look at both countries and uh, you know, ask what are the risks, what are the uh, uh, what are the advantages one way or the other? Why do you call this shareholders guarantee? Why can't the ABC's guarantee? It's just a well, it is ABC's guarantee. I'm just I'm using shareholder guarantee as a general term. In this case, yes, ABC is issuing the guarantee to the lender, not the shareholders of ABC. So ABC is issuing the guarantee to the lender. Thin capitalization. We've talked about the fact that, yes, there are typically local tax advantages of debt over equity. 
and uh, a foreign, now remember, I said that the parent company, ABC, normally doesn't care what the balance sheet looks like. So it doesn't care whether the subsidiary's balance sheet has a lot of debt on it or uh, a lot of equity or a lot of debt and zero, almost zero equity. ABC generally doesn't care. So if debt is better, gives you a better tax answer, then having a foreign parent loan the maximum possible amount to the subsidiary and charge interest on that, uh, that's, that's something that you automatically would do. So this is something that many countries are concerned about because of this uh, benefit of having debt rather than equity. So because many countries are concerned about it, again, we have these thin capitalization rules which are meant to prevent uh, situations that are too greedy. Uh, I think, uh, Wanda, you were referring to a, the U.S. having a 3 to 1 debt equity ratio uh, in 163J. Uh, I f frankly don't remember what's, uh, what's in there, but uh, uh, yeah, a reasonable number of countries do have a 3 to 1 debt equity ratio, or for financial businesses, a 10 to 1 debt equity ratio, or you know, different, uh, different percentages. Each country either has or does not have thin capitalization rules, and then you have to, if they have it, you have to look and see what the terms of it are. And you would generally try to structure how much debt the subsidiary has in order to not lose any interest deductions under the thin capitalization rules. Professor, is that only for foreign investors? depends on the, uh, it's going to depend on the local country's rules, but usually they are only concerned about foreign investors. Why? Because if another domestic company, for example, is the lender, that domestic company will receive all the interest and include it in its taxable income. So economically, you're not so concerned about domestic lenders. Note also, I, I don't think I put it on the slide, but very often these rules, you know, will of course focus primarily on related party debt as opposed to debt from third parties. On related parties, I should say. And if there is debt from an unrelated party, but there is a guarantee from the shareholder or some other related company, then very often these thin cap rules will, will include that debt as related party debt subject to this thin capitalization rule. Uh, and again, I, I don't think I finished uh, the point I was going to make before when I referred to the Chinese investment company rules. <coughs> Most other countries don't have those, and you can very easily have a company, uh, uh, as Yuji uh, uh, is saying, uh, you know, a Japanese company with only one yen of capital, uh, or you know, a company with a uh, hundred uh, rupees of capital, or uh, you know, a local company with a uh, uh, hundred Singapore dollars of capital. I mean, it's not unusual to see companies that have just a very nominal amount of capital. 